I just wanted to meet the basketball players, um, learn about the struggles that they face and how they got throughout them so I can take some of their advice. So in our school, they just uh, selected a handful of students to attend this event and you know, kind of get an opportunity to see how these basketball players that are like normal humans like us kind of dealt with different life situations and how you know, they came to the point that they are right now. 100 Mills to College is my program and they had an invitation to have a basketball hall of fame uh, induction lunch. So I was like, yeah, I would love to go to, to it too. And not only is that happening, it's my favorite players also getting inducted. So I was like, that's another win to come here too. I think it's important for students to be here because uh, it's an important opportunity to celebrate the game of basketball and think about how leadership and education is an important part of the game, but also um, impacts the lives that we live. So I think it's an opportunity to bring those two together. God's favor brought me here today and I have to speak about my program, 100 Males, the college program. It's a good thing for the Brotherhood of Success to get young males of color, not just blacks, but you know, Puerto Ricans mixed into college to know something different. That's what brought me here today. Me being a member of the upcoming program and foundation, Sisters United, I would like to take back some information that I get out of today from the guest speaker or anyone else who speaks and spread knowledge to our community and our women in the community to spread a positive impact throughout Springfield. Um, one of the reasons that I believe that it's important for the students to be here today is because many of them are leaders within our community as well as leaders within our schools. Um, what we have here today is representation from the 100 Males to College, um, which is a makeup of males throughout the entire city from the major high schools and um, other schools within the city, as well as Sisters United. There's some representation of some lead females within our community and our schools who are here to receive some really great information, some really inspirational um, thoughts um, so that they can bring them back into their actual schools and be able to continue to lead this work in our schools as well as our community. Well, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the college, I'm here to not only welcome you, but say we're so glad that you brought better weather. So thank you for whoever's responsible. I know most of you know this, but this is the birthplace of basketball, right? I mean, you may not have known that, but in 1891, our very own Jim Snaysmith created basketball as a graduate student. And so we have a long, long history with basketball. So for this opportunity to have the, to be really the host of a special event means a great deal to us. We also have a number of our trustees from the college here. I'm not gonna go and list all of them, but if they all could wave their hand. We have a lot of our board of trustees members, vice chair and chair at this table over here. And this is a very important day because this is a partnership between three special and unique partners. Not only Springfield College, but Beta Sigma Boulay organization, as well as the Hall of Fame that have come together in what I consider to be, again, one of the most important things we can do, provide great role models for our youth. And we have lots of youth in the back, some that are in uh, secondary school and some of our students here as well. And so I know you're going to hear great things from Grant Hill today. And so we're going to talk with him in just a few moments. But what I thought we would talk a little bit about are his parents. So you say, why are we going to talk about his parents? Because a place like Springfield College is very proud to have student athletes. And, um, and for you, if you don't know very much about Janet and Calvin Hill, you should go Google them. Because I spent some time on Sunday looking through their incredible careers. Grant, I mean, you had a lot to live up to. They were very, very, very busy career people doing a lot of great things. Not only their work with pro athletes and mentoring them, but also their work in making diverse workplaces happen. Your mom in particular has done a great deal of work in making sure that organizations know that the best way that you can be committed to um, 
being the best organization you can be is have the most diverse workforce. And she helped organizations all through her career become more diverse. And I think from my perspective, um, when you look at their careers and they've given time, talent, and treasure to a number of non-for-profits, including the schools that they went to. But at the end of the day, and for the parents in the room, you can do a lot of great things. And then people come up to you and say, aren't you Grant Hill's mother? <laughs> right? Who, who's Calvin Hill? I think he had, he had a, about you, Calvin Hill. And we knew that was going to be a problem. We knew that was going to be a problem starting out. Yeah, Calvin Hill, he played for a couple good teams. He had a pretty good career, but isn't he Grant Hill's father? Right? So when we think about student athletes, I think to myself, what happened to make Grant Hill be Mr. Nice Guy? in the league, and people look up to him and hold him as a role model, I'm going to suggest that some of it happened at home. So I, I did come up and speak to Grant last night very gently. I did not stalk him. So that behavior has been corrected for any of you that have been here in the past. I just approached him very gently, and I said, I have two requests. One, I'd like to take a photo so that I can let people know that you're coming to campus tomorrow. And two, I'd like to talk to you about your parents. And I'd like to talk to everybody about how special your parents are. So you can pass my thanks on to them. But let me tell you a little bit about what they did. They were present, and they shared their values, and they thought that sports was pretty important, but school was the highest priority. School was the highest priority. And so I have two quotes for them. One, when they asked Janet a little bit about her son graduating from Duke, she said, I'm very proud, very proud of his effort, and I'm very proud of, that he listened to me. I think you called her the sergeant? The general. The general. Okay, he said that pretty quick. For those of you that didn't hear in the room, the general, and then a small nod. So I think she has certainly had an impression, right? So when they asked her a little bit about him graduating from Duke, she said, speaking of her and her husband, we think our educations have served us every day since we've been out of college, and that's part of the drumbeat that we have given Grant. So I'm guessing that your daughters probably hear a little bit about that from them as well, right? And from Calvin, really one of my favorite quotes, Simple things are most important, but I've had, and I've had achieved some success in school and in his profession, which I think, again, is an understatement, but I'm proudest of raising my son to be a good person. And so have illustrious careers, and when you think about all the contributions, it's what you do with people and the relationships and the value on education and leadership, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, I'm sorry that Tamea is not with us. Um, I don't know if Grant also, I mean, he's not only has these great parents, he also has this superbly talented, beautiful wife who has released an album today. And so if you haven't had a chance to take your Amazon Prime card out, you can do that. It's called Passion Like Fire. <laughs> Please tell your beautiful bride that she had a little air time. And if I was quicker, I would have gotten out and put them underneath. We could have been like Oprah, and we could have put them on the tables and had everybody take one with them. But it is, you know, it's, it's really amazing to have you here, and I know you're going to share some thoughts about it. But please know that all of our inductees tonight will be thanking coaches and players and people that brought them to where they are in their career. And all of us do that with people that are alongside of us. And so when you think about your own career and being grateful for the people that have helped you, I think it's important for all of our young people to also remember that it is those that came before us that really set the stage for our successes. And so that's really the message I want to share with you today. We're very delighted to have you on campus, um, and congratulations on being our latest Hall of Famer. Thank you. Thank you. I have a small gift. This is a small gift for, um, from the college to Grant. Do you have any eligibility left? Do you have any, just a little? I could, oh, he's got bad wheels. Well, in case you're ever in Kansas where they try to say that they, the people that really created basketball, just wear that shirt. Don't say anything. All right, thank you very much. Okay, next to provide remarks will be Dr. Gregory Vincent, Sire Archon, Grand Sire Archon of Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity.
so uh, Archon Hill, I did have to ask, is it the Calvin Hill? So I did, did, did ask that, that question. To President Cooper, it is an honor uh, to be back in Springfield. And as a, and, and I, I think it's fair to say as a marginal Division Three basketball player, uh, it is great to be in the birthplace of basketball. <laughs> <laughs> To uh, our honoree, uh, Calvin Hill, and all of the other inductees, it is an honor. And the best thing I can say to you, my brother, is that you made me a Duke fan from 1990 to 1994. <laughs> so that's because of, of, of just how you carried yourself. And we're all so very proud of you and all the inductees. And we so appreciate what you've done both on and off the court. And can we give Grant Hill another round of applause? So it is a true honor to be here today, not only to represent our international fraternity, but to speak uh, about the work that Beta Sigma Boule, our member Boule here in Springfield has done. And they exemplify what we're all about. And I know there's a bit of our history in uh, your program, but just to share that we were established in 1904 by six uh, medical professionals uh, who wanted to get to know the best of one another, but also have a collective impact. Um, for many years, we were a secret organization. And increasingly, we have become more public because not because we want fanfare, but because we recognize that the work we're doing is having an impact on uh, communities. And Beta Sigma is a great example of that, the way they not only give scholarships, but also provide that one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring. Just to share just a little bit about my history, um, I did not realize it at the time, because again, the secrecy of the organization, but my life has been impacted from, by archons from birth until today. The man who baptized me was an archon in New York City, and I, I just share that to say that that impact has been uh, quite powerful. Um, with our organization, uh, not just in the United States, but across the globe, our goal is to engage in meaningful social action to uplift our communities, uh, to help young people thrive, to make sure that uh, educational opportunities are provided for them, and that not only are they beating the odds, but that we are changing the odds for young people uh, in communities like Springfield and beyond, such that they can go back and serve their communities. The only thing we ask uh, for the, the, the students and young people we serve is that they remember that and that they pay it forward. And so we're so very uh, honored uh, that young people are doing that. They understand the connection that we have. I could not be more proud of the archive uh, that, that are here. And then finally, I just want to share that in addition to the fraternity, we also have a foundation. And each year, uh, we give out over a million dollars in, uh, in, in grants. And again, this initiative, this partnership is one example of that. But we also are one of the largest contributors to the African American uh, Museum for History and Culture. Uh, we also uh, have been uh, very involved with Jazz and Lincoln Center with our Archon Wynn Marcellus. And under the great leadership of Archon Jolando Jackson, we engage in social action around the country. And so it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to uh, celebrate greatness. Thank you all very much. Our last remarks will come from a Harlem Globetrotter. How many of you had an opportunity to get some picks and tricks outside? Spin the ball on your finger. Very good. All right, I'm going to ask that uh, former player and coach, Sweet Lou Dunbar, come forward. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Hill, it's a pleasure to be here with you, but uh, I wasn't no Duke fan. <laughs> uh, I was a Cowboy fan, so you know who I like in the family. <laughs> but it's an honor for me to be here. I've been with the Harlem Globetrotter now for about 40 years, uh, played for 24 of those 40 years, and I just found out today that I'm a former coach reading the program. I didn't know that until I got here. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm the director, my president and my COO didn't tell me until I got here, they put it in the program. But uh, it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, and I've been doing this a long time. This is the first time coming to Springfield College and it is indeed an honor for me to be here to birth play for basketball because it's been my life. 
It's been my life. And at this time, uh, I'd like to present a couple things to Dr. If you don't mind, Dr. Vincent and uh, Dr. Cooper, please. I don't know if y'all can play. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can play, but you're going to be represented. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. When do we leave town? <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting one, but I guess I didn't get one. <laughs> At the other Calvin Hill. All right. Very good. Very good. Well, now for what you all have been waiting for. Uh, Paul, would you like to come forward and present Mr. Grant Hill? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Lambert. I'm lucky enough to be a vice president at the Basketball Hall of Fame. And on behalf of John DeLeva, our president, and the entire staff at the hall, I just want to thank you all for welcoming us here today for our third annual uh, Educational Leadership Luncheon. As Dr. Cooper mentioned, I hope you all know that the reason we are in Springfield is that this is where this beautiful game was invented by a young Canadian grad student in the winter of 1891. Uh, James Naismith was attending the YMCA Training College, which of course is now Springfield College. What I'd like you to remember is that Dr. Naismith never tried to make money from his invention. He made up the game hoping that everyone would could play and have a healthy life. He believed that a healthy body would lead to a healthy mind and a healthy spirit. And that colored everything that he did. He also believed that his game, this very simple game that he made up, had wonderful characteristics such as fitness, perseverance, commitment to larger goals, and, and teamwork that would ripple through, uh, through people's lives. Many uh, members of the Basketball Hall of Fame live out those goals. They share their time, treasure, and talent with the communities in which they live and work, and today's guest certainly exemplifies that. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He came to national attention during a historic career at Duke University, where he helped lead the Blue Devils to national titles in 1991 and 1992. He was a consensus first team All-America selection and ACC Player of the Year in 1994. And he was the third player taken in the NBA draft in 1994. I remember I was there. And uh, he went on to a 19-year career in the league, including seven All-Star appearances. He was co-rookie of the year in 1995 with one of our other honorees tonight, Jason Kidd. Uh, overcoming numerous injuries and challenges. He's also known for his strength of character and the philanthropic work uh, that he's winning the NBA Sportsman Award three times and the Manny Jackson Basketball's Human Spirit Award from the Hall of Fame. Simply, he's one of the classiest figures in the game. He's elected, he'll be going to the Hall of Fame tonight as a player. Please help me in welcoming our friend, Mr. Grant Hill. He's everywhere. Exactly. Exactly. Well, of course. Yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Springfield College, um, of course, the Boule, uh, the Basketball Hall of Fame, for uh, this wonderful luncheon and this opportunity to come visit with all of you here. Um, I, I must say also, I want to, yesterday, with all the activities at the Hall of Fame, um, Calvin Hill came up and introduced himself and told me his name, and I said he was born in Dallas. So the first thing I thought was maybe I had a little brother. <laughs> and, uh, but then I, I noticed uh, my dad's 6'5", and so it, um, and. Um, One never knows. <laughs> and, and also I'd like to say that I, I vividly uh, remember, it was almost 29 years ago um, that, uh, Prior to that, I was lost, and I saw the light, and I converted and became a Duke Blue Devil. <laughs> and so, sweet Lou, it's not too late. You can convert, too. <laughs> but I'm sorry. I'm sorry, That's Paul. all right. First off, I should mention, Dr. Cooper mentioned that her, she's, her stocking habits have been taken care of. We learned the first year from our friend Shaquille O'Neal that she is a gangster. At uh -huh. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But let's start at the beginning a little bit. Uh, when did you first fall in love with this game? 
You know, I, I first fell in love with basketball in 1980, 81. And, you know, for a lot of the, the young people here, um, the access to basketball wasn't what it is today. And so you, you couldn't go on your phone or watch NBA games uh, every night or even watch college games for every night. So for me, it was really high school basketball. And growing up in Northern Virginia, uh, you know, there, 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 weren't, there weren't a lot of options for your entertainment dollars on the weekend. So you went to high school sporting events. And obviously football was, uh, was big in my household and grew up with a football in my hand and always wanted to play football. But going to the local high school and watching uh, uh, the team that I eventually played for and a guy named uh, Michael Jackson, not, not the singer, <laughs> Um, but a really good player, though. But a really good player. Played Georgetown. at Georgetown. Played yeah. in the NBA. He's had a, a fantastic career in, in corporate America. But he was that that player that first draw you know drew me in. And uh, it's been uh, it's been an amazing journey, a love affair. And you know you start as a fan, and, and you're fortunate to play it and, and have this amazing relationship with the game. Mm. But at the end of the day, you're still a fan. Sure. And that little kid in me is still. Uh, amazed and, and, and just in disbelief at the talent that's out there at all levels. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned, uh, <clears throat> and, and Dr. Cooper mentioned it earlier, you do come from a remarkable family. So there was pressure on you to achieve uh, some success. I mean, your dad, you and he both the co rookie, you're both rookies of the year in your individual leagues, which is interesting. Put, put that to the side. I think it's the only time that ever happened in okay. history. But the pressure growing up to balance education, to balance schoolwork with basketball and the expectations that were growing on you as you became a, a really dominant basketball player. What was that like? How did you manage to make that work? Well, you know, at a young age, the, the pressure was simply, if, if I don't do well in school, I can't play. Yeah. <laughs> so that was that, that was sort of the rule in the household. But, um, you know, education was, was an important part of my parents' life. And, you know, their story... Um, you know, they, they went to school in college close to, to Springfield. My mom was at Wellesley College uh, back in the 60s. My dad was, was at Yale uh, University. And so, um, yeah, it, it was just sort of the expectation. It was um, heavily emphasized from an early age. And, and I just, you know, look, the idea of being an athlete mm -hmm. like that, you know, I mean, maybe play in high school. No, no one ever thought. My parents certainly didn't think that I would, you know, have this professional career mm -hmm. and, and go on. So um, it, it was about, you know, doing well in the classroom. And, uh, and I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate that I had exposure through them to not just sports, not just uh, being on the sidelines or, or going to the Capitol Center to watch mm -hmm. the Bullets play and going in the back and meeting Jeff Rulin and Rick Mahorn and, and, and all those great players back in the day. Uh, but also having access to to culture and, and being able to meet people in the business community. Mm. And, and all of that, I think, really contributed to, to my growth and, and being who I am today. You know, it's interesting. We were just down at Commerce High School with two of your new classmates, Katie Smith and Ray Allen. We were down there talking to some young people. And Ray said an interesting thing about, about uh, one of the things he learned growing up was to be comfortable with himself and to walk away from circumstances that he was not. He said sometimes the toughest, a toughest guy is the guy who sees something that's not right and walks away from it. Did you, I mean, you come from a wonderful family, but all of us are exposed to the world. Did you find that, that you had challenges sometimes? You had to say, you know what? I'm walking away from this. I'm making a choice here to some another direction. No, no question. I mean, you know, growing up, um, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're going to have those moments in your life where you have to make decisions. You come to a fork in a road. And, yeah. and, uh, and that was one of the things that, you know, as a parent, as, as a parent now, you try to impress upon your children. Uh, my parents, you know, tried to do the same with me. And so um, I, I do think that the, good, the thing that, that, that I had that, that helped me was I, was, I, I had goals. Mm -hmm. I had things that I wanted to accomplish and things I wanted to do. And so, you know, I wasn't by any stretch of the imagination perfect, but, um, you know, having sports mm. and the discipline uh, and the structure that sports afforded me uh, really helped me stay focused mm. and stay on track. And uh, even with all the, the 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 resources I had at home and and, and the, the privilege, if you will, that I had, um, you know, you still can get off that track. Mm. And I've seen it happen with with a lot of kids and a lot of people I knew. So, um, you know, basketball was huge, and it helped. You know, and those those values that are necessary to, to be successful mm -hmm. in, in basketball, 
uh, I think, apply and translate into life, into sure. school, into business. Um, they, they transfer. And, and so I, I, you know, I think I you know, maybe was not smart enough to totally realize that at a young age, but um, I certainly do so now. And, and I'm grateful for, you know, obviously the Hall of Fame and my career and, and the doors that basketball has opened for me and the experiences, but the lessons, mm -hmm. you know, those life lessons that you learn at a really young age and you're playing, you learn how to, you know, perseverance and commitment and sacrifice and, you know, working with others, yep. you know, collective responsibility, uh, handling failure and success. All these attributes uh, are, are, are so essential. And, you know, I was fortunate to, to be around it and to experience it my entire life. Those are the core values that Dr. Naismith certainly had in mind. Absolutely. And I should, I should tell the young people who maybe you go home on YouTube now and watch when Grant was a young player with the Detroit Pistons, he was about the best player you could be in the NBA. I mean, he dominated on every level of the game and all the whole total game package you played. You were a point forward before there were point forwards. You could score, you could defend, you could do all that. And with all these wonderful things, suddenly, a couple of years into your career, you got hurt. Uh, and that changed a lot in your life. And I know you, you went, came across some challenges there that were kind of extraordinary. And I wonder if you talk a little bit about that, the young folks who might not know, and how you worked to overcome those challenges. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was, it was you know, it's interesting. As you go through this Hall of Fame process, the, the, there's an exercise where you really sort of start to reflect. And it's interesting because when you're in it, you don't sort of look back. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I never really sort of, processed what, what was happening in Detroit when I was at a really high level and playing the game. And, um, you know, as my, my daughter says, I, I wasn't a scrub <laughs> in my Detroit days. Um, and then when I was going through those dark moments where I was hurt and yeah. I couldn't play, um, and, and then even coming back and now I'm an older player and I'm trying to fight to stay, you know, to be able to continue to play and save my career, you never really sort of look back. So this whole sort of week, the last few months has, has been a chance to really process all that. And, um, and, and it's been interesting, but yeah, I mean, I, I was, you know, life was good. I mean, I was, you know, I came in the league, I made the all-star game. I, you know, I had, you got more votes than Michael Jordan. I got, can you believe that? I got more votes than Michael Jordan. I had my own shoe. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was, you know, I, I, I was, he, I was, People magazine's 50 most beautiful. My daughters can't believe that. But, um, so life was going well. I was improving. I was getting better. And then, bam, yeah. you know, I, I, I got the injury bug. I got hurt and really missed a good portion of four years, yeah. right sort of in the prime of my career, right when it was all supposed to come together. And that's hard. You know, as an athlete, this is the one thing from when you're very young, it kind of validates you, you know, you, 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 it defines you in some ways. And so all of a sudden when you're on top of the world and then you can't play and you, you're, you know, it, it was hard, it was yeah. hard and you're trying to fight to get back. Um, and so, but you know, look, one thing that the beauty of sports and I always try to bring it back to the game, the game sort of conditions you to keep fighting. It conditions you not to quit. It conditions you to, you know, Coach K, who I played for at Duke, Sweet Lou, he's a great guy. Um, <laughs> he'll be there tonight. But, you know, one of the things he used to always talk about is that in the middle of a game, the moment of a game, always move on to the next play. If you make a great play, a great dunk or a three-pointer, celebrate, show some emotion, and then move on and be ready for the next play. Or if you make a bad play, which inevitably happens, you know, don't let that become a drain and, and become consecutive bad plays. Move on to the next play. Well, the same thing. When, when you, life is going to hit you yeah. and life is going to knock you down and, 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 you know, and so you, you, you just got to move on to that next play, learn from it, move forward. And I'll say this, look, it, it hurt my legacy, although I'm here at the Hall of Fame, so, yeah. but it, it, it hurt, you know, in terms of I didn't get a chance to sort of see it all the way through and have a natural progression and then maybe a natural decline as I aged. Um, but it was, in a weird way, the best thing for me. You got it? Sorry. All right, that's all good. <laughs> it's enshrinement day. I'm, no, no, I'm in charge of it. I'm amazed it only rang uh, once. 
I thought you had a more like, you know, kind of a funky ring or something, you know? I was kind of... I'm a working man. That's all. <laughs> working class hero. I forgot where I was at. It's oh. okay. You were, over, you were overcoming obstacles. Yeah, no, there. but just, I mean, that, that, that is life. And, yeah. and sports and life. I mean, no matter who you are, you're going to have adversity. Here I was on top of the world. Everything was great. I was 26 years old. And, you know, you get knocked back. Now, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't the end of the world. But that experience, there was so much growth mm. and so much that I learned about myself going through those pro that process. And I didn't lose my head, and I kind of just kept sawing wood and kept going forward. And so it was a real sort of eye-opener and a life lesson for me. Mm. Uh, and so we all get hit. We all have stuff. We all have to deal with that. And we just you know, continue to make those decisions, those right decisions, continue to work hard. And if you can do that, there'll be a tremendous growth opportunity that you can look back on and really appreciate. And you did place for great teams in high school, college, several wonderful teams in the pros. You had a lot of wonderful teammates. I wonder if, if some stand out in your mind and what made them great teammates? What makes a great teammate as you look through life? We all have teams we're, we're part of. What makes a great teammate to you? Wow. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's the name of the game. The game, you know, is is... is five guys playing together as yeah. one and that's not always that doesn't always happen uh when you play but when when you do have that environment it's special uh i, I think of my fellow hall of fame classmate you know steve nash um he um you know I, when i joined that team i had gone through a dark period and and a really tough time in my career and you know steve who i'm sure you guys all know and and, and watched him play and but just his spirit and his his attitude um, you know, he'd pass you the ball and you'd miss a shot and he'd make it seem like it was a bad pass. <laughs> you know, you're like, no, Steve, I just missed a shot. <laughs> you know, or, you know, he was so unselfish that he didn't want to shoot. And sometimes he would, you know, the matchup would have him where he'd take a lot of shots in a game and he'd apologize. Mm. And you're like, no, you know, stop apologizing. Keep shooting the ball. <laughs> you know, and, and so, I, you know, I, I think to, to experience those five years with him and now, you know, to be able to be teammates again and classmates forever uh, is, is pretty special. Um, you know, Joe Dumars, Johnny Dawkins, who I had early in my career, uh, Mark West. Yeah. You know, these were just I, these were guys. Some were great players. Joe was a Hall of Famer. Mark West was more of a role player, but they all had character and they all were leaders. As we talk about that theme here today. Um, but they served, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were serving their, te their teammates. They were just depositing in us, trying to help us grow, help us learn. And, and I was fortunate to have them early in my career, all throughout my career. Mm -hmm. And then, some, you know, guys like that at the end of my career, like a Steve Nash. Absolutely. And we, you know, we all have teams that were a part of all of you folks who have teams in your life, you know, your family, your community, your schools, all kinds of people. Uh, I was lucky enough in a, an earlier part of my life before I came to the Hall of Fame, one of the teams I was on, I worked for the NBA in New York City for many years, uh, producing league-sponsored events around the world. And one of my great teammates, actually one of the best teammates you could have is here today with us, the Deputy Commissioner of the NBA, Mark Tatum. Uh, <clears throat> And just while we're on the subject of teammates, you have a wonderful team. If you think about the league, the, all the, the folks you interact with on the team level, on the league level, on the, and just the folks who work in the league, what do you think makes a great teammate? Well, first of all, thank you. And Grant, it's great to be here with you. I mean, we, you know, I, I, Grant and I were laughing last night where uh, we came up before he's a Hall of Famer. And we used to have these conversations about the game and about life and, uh, and about lots of different topics. And it's just an honor for me to see you get the recognition that you're going to get tonight and this week. So, um, Paul, to your point about teammates, um, you know, for me, uh, it's all the things that Grant talked about in terms of what you learn through the game of basketball, right? How to be selfless, um, how to be authentic, how to uh, get better and, and ask for advice. I think the best teammates um, are direct with each other. They're honest with each other. Um, it's OK to say, hey, Paul, I see an opportunity where you can actually improve yourself if you do X, Y, and Z. And I think for the young people in the room, as, as you hear you know, Grant, as you hear Dr. Cooper, and, and we all, none of us, got to where we are today without teammates and without assistance. And I think one of the big barriers um, for me was always that pride and feeling like you can't ask for help, like you have to do it by yourself. 
Um, and I would tell you if there's one piece of advice I'd have for the younger folks here, as Grant said, you're going to get hit with adversity. How you deal with that, who you can lean on, who your teammates are that can help you get through that time is going to be critical. And so don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be too proud to seek out others to say, hey, how do I get through this situation? Can you give me some advice? Because those are the things that um, have gotten me through. I know they've gotten Grant through, uh, through his career, and, 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 and so many countless others in this room have experienced that same thing. You're not alone. Rely on your teammates, and it's, it's not a sign of weakness. It will help you get through, but you will get through it. Thank you, Mark. And I know that the gentleman from Beta Sigma Boule, of course, would, would fully agree with that. It's the name of mentorship and, and reaching out to each other. I, I believe there may be some young folk in the room might have a question or two. Do we, do anyone have, raise their hand? Is anyone prepared a question? Uh, and the, oh, I see him. Oh, we got Phil Donahue moving through the crowd here. <laughs> yeah. Don't take that, bro. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Hello? Oh, Hi. My mic is on. Never mind. Hi. Um, I had to type out my question in case I forgot. My name is Akela. I'm a senior at the High School of Science and Technology. Um, my question, I had a two-part question. First part was, as your career continued to rise, what made you go farther and do greater instead of being satisfied once you got to a certain point? My second part of my question was, once this is done, can I take a picture with you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you may. Yes, you may. Um, gr great, great question. Um, you know, I, I, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, just I didn't appreciate maybe early on in my career at Duke and Detroit um, because you're constantly striving. You're constantly, um, you know, once again, I'll bring it back to Coach K, sweet Lou. But, um, you know, one thing, we, we won our first championship in 1991. And um, we, we kind of upset a, a very good and very dominant UNLV team that was undefeated at the time. I'm sure some, some of you younger folks have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but we came back the next season with the same team. And the first, the very first practice, when we all assembled on the first day of school, you know, Coach K uh, emphasized that we are not defending anything. What we won can never be taken away from us. We won that, that championship in 1991. And, and what we're doing is pursuing. You know, we're, and so he wanted to establish that, that sort of theme right away, first day. We're not defending. We're pursuing. We're staying hungry. We're still the hunters. And, and, and for whatever reason, that really kind of resonated with me. And so, you know, as I sort of was able to sort of improve and move on to the NBA and all of a sudden kind of this whirlwind occurred in my life, it was always pursuing, always moving forward, always how can I get better, you know, not being satisfied. Not, and I'm not saying that, you know, sometimes you should stop and smell the roses and mm -hmm. appreciate things. Um, um, but, you know, it, it, it comes at you fast. And so um, that was, I, I guess, maybe how I was wired. And, and you know, I wanted to achieve things and, and, um, and go for it. And, and the great thing about sports that I love, and, and, and I always bring it back to this metaphor with life, but no matter who you are in sports, you have to bring it every moment you're on the court. Every moment you're out there in practice against your teammates, you're playing, you know, in the summer, you're going out in the NBA, and you, you might be playing against Michael Jordan, the best player in the world, or some role player on a team. But every possession, you have to bring it. And so it's just, there's something about that, that thought process, that, that mindset, that it just prepares you, that you just, you're never, like, you're never, you're never really quite satisfied. You're constantly pursuing, like Coach K said. And, and so anyway, I, I, you know. I don't know if I answered your question, but I will, I will take a picture with you for sure. <laughs> and, and, you, uh, and hopefully I answered it. Absolutely. And just, you know, from my, Mike's story is nothing nearly as dramatic as Grant's, obviously. But sometimes what makes you pursue the next step is your life. You know, my wife and I had our first son. 
and suddenly you had to take next steps and you had to take new responsibilities are. And often the, the heroes in life are folks who get up and go to work every day and take care of their families. And uh, it can be sometimes very simple motivations like that. Yes, sir. We're over yeah, here. Uh, where are we? We're over here. Well, there's Phil. Hi, my name is AJ and I go to Amherst Regional High School. And my question was, when you lost a game, how do you deal with it? And like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, one of the things I struggled with when I was your age was always wanting to kind of be perfect and sometimes fearing failure. And my mom used to always say, and I didn't understand it when she would tell me, I understand it now, but she would tell me, don't fear failure, fear success, because more people in life are ruined by it. And, you know, I feel like Failure is a great opportunity for growth. That's when you learn. That's when you self-reflect. That's when you look in the mirror. Uh, it really, sometimes winning can mask things. You know, and, and on the court, in business, you keep striving, you keep excelling, but maybe things aren't quite right, but you don't really, you don't really take a look. You know, you don't really, um, you know, sort of look within when things are, are good. But when you lose, it forces you to, if you care and if you're passionate about that. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, some of the, 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 the best lessons were from failure and from being knocked down and getting hurt or losing games. Um, and so understanding it's, it's, it's not fun, um, but it's, it's part of the process. And it also, I think, you know, makes you really, truly value and appreciate when you do win. And, and but that's, that's life. Like I said earlier, you're going to win and lose and hope. You can win more than you lose at the end of the day. We have a young man over here. Um, hello, my name is Deron Jones from Springfield Technical Community College. I wanted to ask, um, what was your major in college and how has that helped you throughout your career? Great question. So I, I, I was a history and I minored in political science. Yes. And so, oh, you did? <laughs> there you go. Tell you, the, the, the other Calvin Hill was a history major, so. And, uh, I see a trend. We, we, uh, we're going to have to have a talk when I get back. <laughs> no, um, but, you know, you may, you may ask, or you did ask, how, how, did, how did that help me, you know, during my career, and, and, and how is it helping me now? And, you know, I was fortunate at Duke to, to take a, you know, it was a liberal arts education, so I took, you know, I took all types of classes in different subject areas. But the thing that college does is that it, teach, it taught me three things. It teaches you how to think. It teaches you how to problem solve. And it teaches you how to endure. <laughs> and, you know, for me, despite the success of my parents, it, it, was, it was an endurance test for me to get through college. And, uh, but, but that's, all those three qualities are necessary, I believe, in life. And so, you know, sometimes now my kids are like, why do I have to, you know, the Pythagorean theorem, I'm like, I'm, I'm, what am I going to do with this, you know? And, and math is great, because math is all about problem solving. So, and, and life is all about solving problems. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I feel like I use that education and use that experience and use uh, all that I described every day of my life. And I use it in the locker room. You got egos and personalities and trying to juggle. I mean, you know, all, life is nothing but thinking, problem solving, and enduring. And so, um, you know, so, yeah, and I also, you know, I learned, you know, I learned about the, you know, the War of 1812 and, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> You know, the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. Although I don't know if I remember. A, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? Was that close? OK, I was close. But, but, but problem solving, learning how to think, and learning how to endure. Yeah. I see we have a, another question from a gentleman in the front. <laughs> so the newest Harlem Globetrotter, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so in my era, I'm just a, a, a generation just before you, up and through your generation, the best players stayed four years. And you built these relationships with players. And now, obviously, even at Duke, players are staying one year, maybe two. How do you think that that has changed both uh, the, the state of basketball, particularly in college? 
You know, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've experienced both. I, I have a, a, a very unique relationship now. Uh, I cover March Madness, so I'm around the college game. Uh, I also do some television work with the NBA. I'm vice chairman of the Atlanta Hawks. So I, I have a, a bunch of different sort of perspectives as it relates to this. Um, I'll just say this. I'm, I'm glad that I didn't, that we didn't have that generation, that pressure uh, to, to leave early. Um, you know, you had a few that, that left, you know, some of, and some of them are in the Hall of Fame, but it's not like it is now. And I think in part, that's, you know, I think as fans of the college game, um, you remember Duke. You remember Leitner and those, whether you liked Duke or not, <laughs> you remember because you saw them enough and you built a connection with fans and there's a passion that college sports, much like the NBA, exist. And so at times it's a little bit like a revolving door in a way. And, uh, I, you know, it, it's still great and the ratings are still great with college, the tournament and, and you know, you know, Duke and Kentucky and Kansas and all the great teams out there, Villanova. Um, but, you know, also, I, I know for me, those were the best years of my life. And I, you know, it's funny, my wife, um, who's a recording artist, and please go out and, and uh, <laughs> download, because, you know, download where you pay. You know, <laughs> I, you know, that's, 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 uh, but my wife uh, didn't have the good fortune of going to college. She was out working right out of high school. She was signed to Quincy Jones and had an album out. And so when I get together with my old college buddies from Duke, and, and not my teammates, but guys that were in my class and just friends of mine, and she always says, you know, you guys get together and you guys tell the same stories over and over. <laughs> And you laugh at them like you're hearing them for the first time. <laughs> and, and, but you know, some of us, I guess, can relate. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was that was a special time. In terms of the NBA, I mean, look, some of the, I mean, the talented. I'm, I, I'm amazed that these guys are so young, and are so good. And, I mean, even here close to to Springfield, Jason Tatum. Yeah. I mean, he's 19 years old, and to be as skilled and as polished and as ready as as, as he was this past season, and when everybody got hurt, here he goes. He steps up and carries his team in the playoffs. And I'm just thinking, I mean, I, I look at his skill set. It's just off the charts for someone at the age of 19. And so there's no way that I was physically, mentally, emotionally ready to be in the NBA at the age of 19. Truth be told, my last year was probably the best season for me in terms of preparing me for the responsibility of being a top pick. And so, you know, look, part of leadership is being able to adapt and adjust. And we have to be willing to adapt and adjust. And I think as a league and as a college game, we're doing that and we're kind of going through that now. So uh, I, I just know for me, I enjoyed my four years. It prepared me um, like you would never imagine. And um, uh, I'm just glad I don't have to make that decision now as an 18, 19 year old. Yeah. Well, he's just turned 20, so we're curious to see what he turns out when he's old enough to have a beer. You know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we have a young man in the front here. And, and he went to Duke, too. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> How you um, doing? My name is Kyle Stuckey. Um, so I know that growing up in Springfield, for me, uh, I've seen a lot of men of color who didn't really have. Um, either father figures or male role models in their life. Um, so what type of struggle was it to find a mentor if you had a mentor and what type of advice did he give you? I mean, for, for me, I, I, you know, I was fortunate to, you know, my, my mentor, they were my parents and they were, you know, sometimes as a kid, you don't, you know, you don't necessarily appreciate, you know, your, your parents and, and them being around. And sadly, at times I was embarrassed um, it, when I was young, you know, 11, 12 years of age, um, because, you know, my dad was always around and a lot of my friends' dads weren't. And what I realized was that they really appreciated and valued him. And they, they used to call him Cool Cal. Hmm. And they, called my, they were the ones that called my mother the general. It wasn't me. They, they, <laughs> they saluted my mother. That's how hardcore she was. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that there are, are men in, in, in any community who 
um, you know, who are willing to be helpful, teachers, uh, people, you know, members of the church, elders. I think you have uh, all young men and, and, and all young boys and girls, uh, particularly boys and girls of color, uh, there are uh, mentors and people who have experience who are willing to share and be helpful. And you just have to maybe take a little bit of extra, extra effort to find them. But uh, they're there. And, and a lot of them I see here. I exactly. Mean, the, 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 the Beta Sigma Boule and what they're about, you know, to me really embodies <laughs> that spirit. So um, I was fortunate, but I know a lot of my friends who, who didn't necessarily have that that, that, that same uh, opportunity uh, were able to take advantage of, of folks in, in, that were in the community in some form or fashion and, and really help impact them in their lives. And, and to the, you know, the young man to the point that Grant just made, uh, that's really why we do this luncheon to a certain extent, is to exemplify and to, to really hammer home the fact that these folks in this room, from Pastor McFadden, all the, all the archons and the gentlemen from Beta Sigma Boule, we're here because we care about you. We're here because we want you to succeed. And these folks are here to, to offer themselves up as examples, but also just let them know that you're, if you need help, if you're someone in your life, uh, that's why we're here. We're all in this together. And I'll just say this. I mean, I've been very impressed with how thoughtful and insightful these questions have been. And so I really want to applaud all the young folks for, you know, very impressive. Thank you. Very impressive. We have time for one more, uh, Mr. Donahue. Okay. Two, maybe two more. Okay. Yeah, my name is Jerry is Hayes. Um, I attend the school, the high school of science and technology. Um, I have a double question. What I want to know is what kind of sacrifices did you make to reach the goal that you wanted to do? And what were the people that helped you got there? When, you know, confidants, those are the people that are for you, unconditional love, the people that are truly for you, and then being constituents, the people that are not for you but are for what you are for, and then comrades, they're not for you or for what you are for, but they are against what you are against. Yeah, okay. Um, I like that. Um, yeah, no, that, that was impressive. And you're in high school, huh? Yeah, okay. Uh, that was impressive. Um, You know, I think it's important to have goals. It's important to have a vision of what you want. And, and that vision can change, and it will change as, as life goes on. Um, one thing that I had to realize, and at times it wasn't easy, at different stages of my life, that if you have a vision, not everybody can go there with you. And sometimes you have to trim the fat. And sometimes you have to, you know, you know, you have to watch those that are in your circle, even in the NBA. You know, even when I got to that level, and I'm, you know, I'm in the NBA now, and I'm, you know, I'm feeling myself a little bit. Um, you know, you, you naturally are going to be guarded when you come across new people, people who you didn't know. But what I had to realize was that the people that you've known all along, they may not, may not be what's best for you as you're moving forward. And that's a hard and that's a very painful thing to realize. Um, and so at different state, and even now, I mean, look, my wife always says people come in, was it? People come in your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And you just have to figure out which category, what box they're in. And, um, and so, um, you know, it, you, you, you know, if you're focused and you're driven and you're, you know, in high school and, and asking a question like that, then you, you, you'll have the, the, the ability to decipher what's best. And, uh, and then, you know, just sometimes you just got to remove yourself. You got to make those sacrifices. And, so, and it won't always be easy, but it's something that, you know, you appreciate later in life. And in the back. My name is Avion Monroe, right? And in my school at Chestnut Academy. And what is your take on Colin Kaepernick and at least taking stands on issues? Yeah. No, I, I, um, I absolutely, first of all, thank you for the question. I love what, what he's done. Um, I feel like the message has been confused uh, in terms of why he's doing it. And uh, I think that speaks to a bigger issue that's going on right now with the divisiveness in our country. Um, but. You know, I think there's a history in sports where athletes have, have spoken up. And 
and, and talked and fought for social, social change. And I think of our own league. I think of people, Bill Russell, who was close to this community and what uh, he endured, but also the courage that he uh, had in his life. I think of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, another person who uh, spoke up at times. And, uh, and, and Muhammad Ali, there's a, there's a long list. And, and then this current generation and just how active they are, how aware they are of their platform and how willing uh, LeBron James, you know, how he um, is on his more than an athlete tour right now all over the world and really having an impact, not just with his greatness on the court, uh, but who he is and what he embodies off the court. Uh, so Kaepernick, yes. I mean, I, I, um, I think it's great. I'm also grateful that, you know, as a league, we are willing to embrace our athletes and allowing them to have a voice. And I think that speaks to the leadership that we have within the ranks in the, in, in the NBA. I will say this, you know, and, and sometimes I've thought about it, like our generation, when I was, you know, in the 90s, and why didn't we do that? And, you know, I, I, I think there was a lot of really good guys, and I think guys that uh, are thoughtful, guys that are going to educate themselves, that you know, understand the issues, uh, much like today's generation. But I do think that the times were just different. I think the internet and technology, the access now to information. You know, if I lived in Detroit, I didn't know what happened. In I mean, it was there, but you had to really work hard to investigate it and to find it. Now it's so easy which is awesome and that we can share and, uh, information with one another. Also, social media. You know, th this is kind of funny, but w when you came in the NBA, when I came in in the 90s, you know, the rookies had to do things, you know? And so, like, my, my job with the Pistons, I had to it – was a, it was a kind of a dirty, nasty job because I had to clean up the shower after the players used the shower. I had to put the trainer's gloves on and get the wash rags from the shower. And – you know, here I am, I'm leading the team in points and rebounds and assists, and I have to, but that was part of your responsibilities as a rookie. And we'd go to team dinners, and you'd go to, you know, to Cheesecake Factory or TGI Fridays or wherever we went on the road, and they would make you, like, skip around the restaurant and sing, you know, row, row, row your boat, and, or whatever. and all of us would be just be embarrassed. And, but now this generation, you know, towards the end of my career, I retired in 2013, that younger generation, they embraced all of that. Like they, they loved being on and, and doing things. And I think part of it is because they're, they've lived their life doing this, being on. And they're accustomed to that. And so I think they have an awareness of who they are and their will. I think that plays a role in their desire uh, as a generation, maybe, to, maybe a stretch, but to, um, to speak out. And, and I'm proud of them and uh, I'm proud of our league and I'm proud, I'm proud of Colin Kaepernick. Tonight's going to be rough because you can tell I'm pretty long-winded. So, good thing I'm going first. Or maybe that's not. Maybe it's not a good thing I'm going first. Yeah. So it's, we've worked on that. Yes. Exactly. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Chantal. I go to Springfield Honors Academy at Commerce. Uh, but um, yeah, my question is uh, between high school, college, and going into the NBA, and with like all the publicity and the publicity and stuff. How did you get mentally and like physically prepared for all of that? Because I'm pretty sure when it goes to high school, to like the MBA or like the college to MBA, is like a bunch more that you have to get prepared for. Right. No. No question. So in high school, you grow up. Every, well, you grow up with everybody you're in school with. So all of my classmates, you know, the, the folks that I was in school with during my four years, we all kind of came up. You know, elementary school, middle school. So they didn't really, you know, they, you know, I, I was a, a, a pretty good basketball player, but, you know, I was just the same old, you know, same old G. And, uh, and then I got to college at Duke, and I remember at freshman orientation, and this is before the internet, and so I'm at, you know, I'm walking around and doing the various activities, and people are coming up to me, and they know my high school stats. And, they're t and I'm thinking, oh, this is like a cult. You know, and, 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 and so there, it, was a, it was a notch up in terms of just the, the magnitude of, of it all. 
But even then, you know, Duke's like Springfield in a way. It's a small liberal arts college. And, and so you get, it's an intimate environment. And so, you know, you're a celebrity, but not that much of a celebrity. And then I, it, when I got to the NBA, it was just on a whole nother level. And I kind of realized, and, I, you know, the NBA, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's kind of like a, a global public relations and marketing firm. And when you are attached to that brand, you have a global reach yeah. and it's amazing. And I can, I've gone all over the world and somehow it ties back to my association in some capacity to the NBA. I remember going, I went on a, um, on a Duke uh, <laughs> trip during the lockout back in 2011, I think. And uh, we went to China. And in China, uh, it, was a, it was an exhibition tour um, around this time in 2011. And um, the college game is not known in, in China. But because Coach K coached USA basketball and he coached LeBron James and Kobe Bryant and Chris Paul, they knew who he was. And so we went over there, took my family, went to Beijing, went to Shanghai, went to Kunshan, which is um, Duke has a campus in Kunshan. So we went all over. And literally, like, you know, at this point, I'm, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm barely hanging on in the NBA. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm barely hanging on. And so uh, we go over, and we're in these magnificent arenas. And they had to have security come for me, come like just to hang around me to keep the fans away. And Doc Rivers was there, who coached in Boston and is now with the Clippers. And his son was a freshman at Duke. And so then I, I just saw, I saw it like, wow, like, like I, you know, I feel like a rock star here, you know. And and uh, but it, but but just. So yeah, it was an adjustment. It was an adjustment and um, you know, it was a great ride, but it was also scary because the, the combination of, of fame, of uh, youth and, and money can be dangerous. And, and so um, you know, thankfully I, I was able to navigate all of that, but that, nothing really prepares you for that. Um, now, well, I will say that I think that the kids today are more aware of all of it. They're, they're, they're exposed to more as they're coming through the ranks. So when they enter into the league, I do think they're better prepared. But I, I didn't know what to expect. And that first year was actually, I mean, it was just, it overwhelmed me. It really did. Well, as you can tell, we could sit here and, and talk all afternoon, but I have to get Mr. Hill back because he has to get into the Hall of Fame tonight. Uh -huh. uh, so we're going to wrap this up, but uh, please join me in one last round of applause for our guest, Thank Mr. You. Grant Hill. our evening. Vince, I'm sorry. Vince Jackson, Sire Arcana, Beta Sigma Boulay. I apologize for that. Skipped ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Archon Calvin Hill. You're the man of the hour. I think we've had a terrific afternoon, wouldn't you say? So I, I just want to let you know that I am delighted to be Sire Archon of Beta Sigma Boule. In times like this and in moments like this, this is where I get my greatest joy. And I also want to uh, first say thank you, Grant Hill. It seems like I can't say Grant. I have to say Mr. Hill, but I have to say together, Grant Hill. You've got one of those names that has to go together. <laughs> so thank you so much for inspiring us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. And I want to also thank again the Grand Sire Archon Gregory Vincent and our Grand Social Action Chair Jorlando Jackson for, for coming in and being with us again. <laughs> and to our partners, the uh, Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame, we appreciate the partnership. Thank you also Deputy Commissioner Archon Mark Tatum, and Archon Harold Mills for being with us this afternoon. And uh, to Springfield College, President Cooper, and to my fellow Archon Calvin Hill, thank you so much for your hospitality. We greatly appreciate the partnership. 
Now, in the Boule, we feel that social action is a necessary investment. And it begins with education, experiences, and exposure that we provide for young people. And if we don't make that investment, we already have tremendous work to do on the other end of social change, as Mr. Hill pointed out, social justice. So we take a proactive stance and a preventive measure to that and make sure that we do the necessary investments in social action. And in the boule, we are often reminded of an old saying that says, if you come across a turtle sitting atop a fence post, then you know that he, or it could be a she, didn't get there on its own. Someone lifted that turtle up and gave it a perspective that could not be realized without a higher elevation. And for that, we are extremely proud and with that, I would like to take just a minute to introduce you to a few turtle lifters in the boule. <laughs> and uh, the planning committee, Brooks Fitch, if you will stand as I call your name, Archons Brooks Fitch, Jeff Johnson, Michael Johnson, who may not be here, Greg Thomas, Fred George, Jocelyn Cesar, and Calvin Hill have worked tirelessly over the summer. <laughs> when others of us had a two-month hiatus. And also, I'd like to recognize Archon Michael Weeks, who is the chairman of the Beta Sigma Social Action Committee. <laughs> and I would like all the Archons of Beta Sigma Boulay to stand. Just stand quickly. Thank you so much for your leadership and support. And we could not do what we do without the Arcusai of Beta Sigma Boule, our wives who love us, support us, and encourage us, and inspire us. So would you please stand? Thank you so much for leaving the lights on when we come home late at night. And are there any other Archons from other member Boulets who are with us? I know I've recognized Archons Tatum and Mills, but anyone else? Okay, I think we're set. And I'll just close by saying to the young people, we want you to dream and we want you to dream big. And we want you to take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way to help you achieve those dreams. And if you'll look in the back of the program next to the last page or so, uh, you see a list of opportunities that Beta Sigma Boule provides in terms of social action. We invite you and encourage you to participate and join us. So with that, thanks to everyone who came this afternoon, and have a blessed day. I think the best thing I can do in summary is say thank you. Uh, that really sums it up. Uh, Hall of Famer Grant Hill, uh, we really have to say that you personify what we have been trying to convey. It's all about being a Hall of Famer in basketball, but you really personify the aspirational and inspirational modeling that we think is imperative in terms of your faith, your perseverance, your discipline, and your service. Let me just give you another example. You've all heard a lot about Grant Hill. He's done a lot. But just as one example, uh, we in Beta Sigma Boule have been able to serve 75 students today. Thank you for that. We also are going to be able to serve 130 tomorrow at the Full Court Press. And it is an unprecedented event, thanks to the retired NBA, thanks to the Basketball Hall of Fame, and thanks to, obviously, a number of you in this room. But for the first time, this is our third year, for the first time, our honoree, our speaker, is going to be at that function as well as being here. So when you talk about service to the community and what he's trying to do to share a message, that speaks volumes. So once again, thank you. Greatly appreciate it. And I must just summarize, because we have to talk about impact. You know, you all are here, you're all being supported, but what really has happened? Let me just highlight a couple of things here for you. First of all, uh, I mentioned the 75 students today, 130 tomorrow. Beta Sigma Boule has been able to go, thanks to your support, 
in many ways, we've been able to go from initially being able to impact years ago, approximately 20 students, to we're re really able to impact now 450. Uh, we've gone from starting with one $500 scholarship, now we offer two four-year $4,000 scholarships and one four-year $10,000 scholarship. We've been able to go from serving three student-centered organizations to 10. We now work with 10 different organizations to make sure that we can serve the students and the community properly. That's very, very much thanks to you. And also, we've been able to add, we talk about partnerships. This is not just sponsorship. That's important. But we really form partnerships. We now have been able to add seven new partners in this last year. So it's all thanks to you. But since we're in the mode of Sarah Archon Vincent, I had people stand up. And I think that's all very good. We're going to continue that just a little bit. I'd like you to hold your applause. But I'd like to, if you don't mind, have a group of individuals and organizations stand up. These are our partners. And I know we've already highlighted several of them. But of course, the newest Harlem Globetrotter uh, from Sigma Pi Phi fraternity and Archon Jackson representing Sigma Pi Phi fraternity. If they hold your applause, please. Uh, Belize Lexus on your front on your table, you've got the Black Panther book. Belize and Lexus had a relationship with Black Panther. They sponsored the movie licensing agreement. That comic, that graphic novel, is outstanding. Please take it, read it, and for the students, we're going to come back to you because we're going to ask you some questions later. We're reforming something. It will be very informative for you, but very, very good. So Belize Lexus, uh, the National Basketball M uh, Memorial Hall of Fame. Of course, Paul Lambert, if you stand. The Springfield College team, if you would stand, if you don't mind. Uh, University of Massachusetts Athletics Department, if you would stand. STCC, MGM Springfield Resort Casino. Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts, WGBY, Beverage Family Foundation. It should be Teed Capital Management, if you stand. And then Al Griggs, Jocelyn Cesar, Frederick George, Vincent Jackson, Michael Johnson, Johnny Whitehead. And also, I would add to that NCCJ, if you would stand, please and Alpha Psi Boulet. Please look around. These are the people that really step forward to be our partners. Thank you. So to all of you, we say once again, thank you. This is all about aspirational, inspirational modeling. But at the same time, we've tried to create an experience, not just an event, but experience, because it is all about experience and inspire greatness. And hopefully that happened today. Did you feel that today? Yes. All right. Good. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, students, thank you very, very much. Greatly appreciate it. Well, I think it's very important to have good partners. And I said that in my comments earlier today, but this is a unique event that brings together three strong partners, all that have similar values in terms of education and leadership. And so it's great to have the high school students here, and it's great to have our college students here. But I bet you that the adults in the room equally were impressed and learned from Mr. Hill today. I mean, he was, I thought his comments were absolutely very powerful. So I'm very proud to make sure that we continue to be the host. We feel the event in itself is very inspirational. See, a lot of people, they talk about dreams, and people think it's a fantasy, but it's good to know that he was an ordinary man who achieved an extraordinary goal. And now we're all ordinary people, but we're all unique in our own individual way to express ourselves and to achieve something that we can actually make it in this life. I think this is a great event, and, and for me, being here at Springfield College, I've, I've been with the Globe Clubs for 40 years, as I say. That, and uh, I've been to the Hall of Fame numerous times, but it's the first time coming to the birthplace of basketball, and this was great. And for the kids in here, I think it's very educational and very insightful for them to be here. And uh, Beta Sigma Bully, awesome. I, oh my goodness, it's awesome. I think they're doing a great job and hope they continue to do what they're doing. And if I can come back, I will be back because this was an awesome experience for me today.
something that I really enjoyed about this program is all the great advice that the young students here uh, that joined us today got from Grant Hill and I really appreciated the community coming together as well. It was really inspiring because I like I like watching old basketball and like Grant Hill is one of my biggest inspirations. Well I think we were able to impact a number of people. The key people we wanted to impact are the students and I could tell by the questions, I could tell by their energy, I could tell by the way they hung around and just wanted to be involved that I think we hit the mark. It's all about providing them an aspirational and inspirational opportunity. We want them to be inspired by greatness. The greatness is not just Grant Hill who is absolutely great. But there are people in this room that represent greatness, and each student represents greatness. We're trying to help bring that out. So I think on balance, I think we achieved our goals.